and uh, but one man years later was talking to his friend here in the property, could be in one of these pubs here, and he said, what would you have done if you had your time over again? He says, to hell with the women and children first, he says, I'm winning and rescue me back up. And what had happened was, the day after the boring, he had to go to the bank to see if he could get some money out, to probably buy clothes, a bit of food, and find somewhere for his family to live. And the bank refused to give him the money because he had no proof, no passport to show that he had money in it. But obviously the situation was resolved shortly after, but he thought obviously he had enough trouble without the loss of his bank book. A couple of three days later, many of the, the business people in town had hired an engineer in Roscommon, a man called Rafter, to come out and assess the damages. And uh, as he came into the village, he noted what he saw, and he said, in the crockery still smoulders like a lime kiln. So the fire was already out two days at this stage, but everything was smoldering, much like a lime kiln. So he went round and he assessed what he felt with the damages, and most of the houses, the gable ends were there, the roof had gone, but the gable ends were there, the internal walls were still there. And he was sort of thinking that perhaps we put a roof on and made it safe, we can then put in the windows and the doors and we can get back into a habitable building. But he returned two or three days later again, and many of those houses that he saw still standing had now fallen. What had happened was they were so hot from the heat of the fires, they had expanded. And then as they cooled down, they fell. So it meant that the house was wrecked. They had to rebuild the whole place. So all those people who uh, lost their homes had to go and live with relatives or friends nearby. And probably some of them eventually had to go further afield. They may have gone to England, may have gone to America. So it would be an interesting project to find out who was here in 1920 and how many still remain or stood after it. Because obviously a lot of those people who lived in the village didn't come back. They had no jobs, no homes, no clothes, no income. So we are in a dire situation. Now there was one hope. They needed money. And there was a, an organisation in America called the White Cross. And we've all heard of the Red Cross, who give medical aid in times of war and uh, disasters caused by floods and so on and storms. But this White Cross organisation in America was a collection of money in America to help defray costs of people who have been dispossessed by the War of Independence, by fire, by you know houses and homes being destroyed. And they sent money to Dublin. And they sent it to the Quakers, an organisation they felt had no axe to grind, they were neither Protestant nor nationalist. So they thought they were giving this money to an organisation that had no, say, friends that would be given a lot of money to rather than giving it to a special amount to each individual. And then when they subdivided the money, they decided to give the contributions from the corporate to the station master in the property, a man called McGrath. Now he had come from another station in um, me about four years previously, but he was considered to be obviously not a native of the area. He may not have too many close friends he would favour, so he was given the, the, the task of doling out the money to help people buy clothes, pay rent, and so on. And this organisation, um, giving funds to people in a similar position throughout the country. And indeed, uh, the White Cross was still giving out money until 1947, over 25 years after the events. Then around, when you had then the, say, Sean McClone was still in jail at that time. But unbeknownst to most of the IRA people and the British, there were secret back channel negotiations going on to see could it be a truce. And in July, July of 1921, a ceasefire was declared, and that led to the Anglo-Irish talks and an agreement in December of that year. But part of the deal was Collins insisted that McKeown be released, otherwise there'd be no ceasefire. So that was the saviour of McKeown. He was released from prison. And he was probably part of the negotiations that went on in, in London afterwards. Um, some years, well, two years later, McKeown got married and 
he went to London for a holiday with his new wife and he must have befriended some MPs in London they heard he was coming and they asked him would he come to a meeting in the House of the Commons a private meeting in, in one of the rooms there and the object was they wanted to convince other members of Parliament that it was time to get rid of uh, Lloyd George and he was asked where did you get all the ammunition and you know all the guns and how could you keep fighting and how would you keep uh, the British Army on their own and he told them, literally told them that we are nearly down to our last boat we couldn't have survived much longer you know and the British didn't realise that if they stuck on for another while there's going to be a gun, a, a gun or a bullet or a pellet left. and I know they were so desperate I know over in Castle Reed there's a there's a mausoleum at an old house and uh, there were four coffins in it and were lead lined and one of the coffins had the lead stripped off it to make pellets so that short they couldn't buy pellets they had to make their own and that's how desperate they were so 1923 comes along there, there was a compensation agreed and uh, money came to rebuild the houses and the shops here in the village I think the Corleys got 3,900 and something to rebuild their business but that was for rebuilding their, of their property only they didn't get compensation for loss of profit or loss of income um, George Roper who owned several cottages in the village and some of those cottages had two families and sometimes even three families in them he refused compensation he didn't want to rebuild but he was given compensation of the equivalent of 17 years rent for three cottages but the poor people who lived in those cottages got nothing no compensation at all for loss of their homes you know so it, it was a desperate situation and in some cases unfair um, for instance uh, my drum castle was burned down at the time as a reprisal, as a reprisal by the, the IRA and the man that lived there got 60,000 compensation even though he didn't even live in the place, he was living in London. He was a member of Parliament, or a member of the House of Lords, rather. And his main home was in London. He got 60,000 sterling, which was a colossal amount. So, just depends who you were and what your compensation was. Um, there was local contractors from uh, Kiltoon, a uh, family called Killian. They were mainly responsible for the rebuilding of, of the property and uh, obviously it took a year or two before they were back in, in business and uh, that basically was the run through from say 1990 to 1923 but Necropolis definitely suffered very badly the uh, clay pipe industry was destroyed never to be revived other than the craft shop we have now with, with Ethel and Kelly and uh, obviously the people who worked in that business they lost their jobs but, if the truth be known, the uh, clay pipe industry was in decline because cigarettes were becoming popular, especially during the First World War. So the use of clay pipes was becoming uh, redundant. So uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll gladly try and answer them.